The air was surprisingly cold in Wairika, California that evening in May of 2008, just a brisk 58 degrees. But inside the house of Jody Arias, a fire was raging out of control and she was no longer able to contain it. Travis had spent that evening rightfully berating Jody over her myriad of recent misdeeds. The unauthorized access of his social media accounts, slashing his tires, and lying to him constantly. Somehow in her deranged mind, she seemed to believe that hacking his personal accounts was the only way she could keep tabs on him because he couldn't be trusted to tell her the truth himself. Somewhere deep down, she knew it was wrong, but she couldn't control any of her impulsive behaviors anymore. She had tried before, but never actually succeeded for any length of time. And even though they had fought so many times before this, this time was different. Jody knew she had broken whatever was left between them, and he would never let this go. Just weeks before, Travis had cornered her in another series of lies and angrily scolded her, saying that he would tell her parents her friends and her entire church family the truth about who she really was. Jody cared deeply about how she was perceived and Travis was threatening to completely expose her to the one group of people Jody valued most. She could not allow that to happen. Once more, the familiar darkness that had consumed Jody for so much of her life crept back in, but this time was more than crippling depression and sadness this time brought a blinding rage that seemed to consume her every thought, and the anger that burned within her was almost more than she could bear. Now on one hand, she knew that accessing his social media and email was beyond the pale, and that she had sinned, but on the other, he had said that she was sick and evil. In her mind, she believed that she was a truly good person, someone who had tried so hard to be good, to be everything Travis ever wanted. She read the Book of Mormon, she got baptized, she joined his church, she even moved to Arizona to be closer to him. She had become everything he had ever hoped to find in a wife, and yet she knew she would never be as good as Mimi in the eyes of Travis. And just the thought of Marie Mimi Hall was enough to send Jody into a tailspin. And all of this left Jody perplexed because she had somehow allowed herself to believe that this chameleon-like behavior was how you earned love and devotion, and she simply couldn't comprehend why it didn't work. Because what she wanted most, marriage, love, and companionship, all of that was gone now. Just then her phone vibrated. It was Travis texting her back. She feverishly opened her phone, hoping for a heartfelt apology or maybe some acknowledgement of her feelings, but what Travis had sent rocked her to her core. Jody, I don't want your apology. I want you to understand what I think of you. I want you to understand how evil I think you are. You are the worst thing that ever happened to me. You are a sociopath. You have caused me more pain than the death of my father. How can a heart beat in such a corrupted carcass? You tried to murder me from the inside out. I hate you. Jody dropped the phone in stunned silence. Staring out the window of her grandparents' bedroom, her eyes turned black in the midnight sky. The dark void she had been able to push down for most of her life a dark passenger that had been a silent part of her for so long, it again reached out, and this time, she wouldn't push it away. Peering through the dark recesses of her twisted mind, she began to conjure the distorted justification she would need to enact her perverse plan. She suddenly realized she was trembling from the anger that was now boiling over through the white hot tears pouring down her face. She wouldn't allow anyone to ruin her life the way she knew that Travis could. And so she set forth concocting a truly diabolical plan that would finally give her the attention, empathy, and love that she had always wanted. And to show Travis once and for all exactly who Jody Arias truly was. I believe that was the night Jody made up her mind to end the life of Travis Alexander. 
because less than 24 hours later, she stole her grandparents' handgun and began setting the stage for her alibi. Jody carefully and meticulously crafted a plan of unholy retribution on a man that had given her more than she ever deserved, and a man for whom she would take absolutely everything. Jody Arias had set the stage and now would attempt to get away with premeditated homicide. And before this case would end, her life or death would be decided by her ability to convince just one person that her lies were in fact the truth. We the jury, duly impaneled and sworn in the above entitled action upon our oaths, unanimous, unanimously find, having considered all of the facts and circumstances, that the defendant should be sentenced no unanimous, no, no unanimous agreement, signed for person. This is through the eyes of a pathological liar, the Jody Arias case, episode two. Welcome back to Behind Criminal Minds. Now, before we get started today, I wanna to take a moment to thank each and every one of you for your incredible support. It may be obvious, but I'm very new to creating content on YouTube. However, this work has been a lifelong dream of mine, and I am truly grateful for all of your kind support, your comments, feedback, and even the constructive criticism. It's valued more than I can express with words. Also, if you have any suggestions of cases that you would like for me to cover, please write it in the comments below and make your case for why you think it deserves to be covered in a future episode. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing. It goes a long way in helping me to continue to grow and hopefully reach more people with this content. Now, with that said, in today's episode, we will continue our analysis of the initial conversations that Jody Arias had with Detective Flores. And coming up in episode three, I will outline what I believe is the smoking gun and overwhelming evidence that supports why I believe she planned every step of this brutal homicide weeks before it occurred. Let's begin. In episode one of our analysis of the Jody Arias case, we listened to the bizarre conversation between Detective Flores and Jody Arias just one day after Travis had been found by his friends viciously slain in his bathroom. But before Detective Flores would hang up the phone with Jody that day, he would ask her if she had any questions for him, and again Jody would give away more about her involvement than she could have ever intended. Yeah, do you know when all this happened? I mean, I got a call last night, but is there any word on... Um, sometime between Thursday and uh, last night. Jody's question seems innocent enough, and it's clear that she's attempting to sound like a concerned ex-girlfriend. However, with the benefit of hindsight, it's now obvious that Jody is only trying to ascertain information that is entirely self-serving. And this will become crystal clear with the question she's about to ask next. We're, we're not sure yet. We have a good point. Um, and you said that maybe multiple people, because he's a big guy. It was. I maybe you can't talk about this, but was there um, was there like any kind of weapon used, or, um, or was there was it, was there a gun? Was there? I can't say what type of weapon was used, but yeah, I, I, I'm guessing there was a weapon used by the type of injury. For me, this question is completely damning. Remember, this is the very first time that Jody is speaking with law enforcement. She's already admitting that she doesn't know anything about what happened to Travis and that the people she's talked to about it haven't been able to give her any details concerning his homicide. So why in the world would she or anyone want to know what kind of weapon or gun was used in the commission of this crime? Only the person responsible for this crime could have known that a gun had anything to do with his death. And her question alone directly implicates her involvement. Um, do, do you know of him having any weapons at all in the house? Um, his two fists, really. 
Now, much has been said about this comment and Travis's two fists, especially by the number of supporters that Jody still has years after her conviction. Many have asserted that this is Jody's first verbal attempt to try and explain to law enforcement the physical abuse she claims to have endured at the hands of Travis. But I want to be crystal clear. This viewpoint is not something we will ever entertain in the slightest on this channel. There was no credible evidence provided before, during, or after the trial that supports that Jody Arias was a victim of physical abuse in her relationship with Travis. Travis was the victim, not Jody, and no amount of emotional abuse is justification for committing one of the most brutal and vicious homicides the state of Arizona has ever seen. With that said, this next segment is the follow-up call to Jody conducted on June 25th, 2008 by Detective Flores. Let's continue. No, he wasn't one to keep any of that that I used to. No, he was more into like wrestling and UFC, and he had, a, you know, he said he had just bought a punching bag, and yeah. he's like, I love seeing the crowd on the punching bag, you know. How long did you guys actually know each other? We met in September of 2006 at the NGM Grand. Two thousand. Yeah, and that was the pre legal uh, international convention. Or tens of thousands of people go. And when did you guys actually start dating? Um, not for a while. We met in September. Uh, the following weekend, he invited me to church. And the following Wednesday of that Sunday, he gave me a copy of the Book of Mormon. I started reading it. I got baptized November 26th. Um, we would talk a lot and hang out a lot. and We kind of had like a thing, and there was definitely an attraction and an interest, but we weren't officially dating until about February of 2007. Oh, it's that bright day. Um, and I think it just uh, uh, a string of events sort of pushed that together. Travis has kind of a commitment uh, phobia, I guess you could say. The friends and family of Travis Alexander would eventually testify to the fact that Travis had vocalized on many different occasions his deep-seated desire to find a partner and to get married. Travis didn't have a commitment phobia. He had a Jody phobia. And he even said as much in his messages to Jody the week before she ended his life. This is now the second time Jody has spoken with law enforcement. And again, she sees fit to try and drag Travis through the mud any way she can. And so, down here? No, I didn't move down actually until June, which was right about the time we broke up, ironically. She went um, in June of 2007 and you guys broke up soon after? Yeah, we broke up right at the same time. You can probably see by now, there's almost too much to cover in this segment, but I can't skip over this. So according to Jody's own version of events, she and Travis broke up June 29th of 2007, and she didn't even move to Mesa until the end of July, one month after they broke up. Jody demonstrates her intentional efforts to mislead law enforcement because she is intimately aware of how the truth makes her look. And she demonstrates her skill and ability to lie on demand and with such regularity that anyone not paying close attention will easily miss it. I've been in relationships before where the, the other guy wasn't faithful. And there's like a distinctive gut feeling that you just have and that I've noticed. And because I've been in relationships where they were faithful, at least to my knowledge, they were totally faithful. Um, and that, that feeling just isn't there. And so I had this feeling with Travis, and I gently asked him about it. He got really upset, and he's like, he's like, no, there's nothing there. Don't worry about it. And, and I knew he was on his phone texting a lot, and I knew he was texting these girls. And I was like, um, I was like, well, are you, what about your text messages? He's like, look, I can be flirtatious, but there's nothing going on. And I said, okay. So uh, this was last year, I think in June. <clears throat> and one day he was taking a nap, and I felt... This is why we lost. This is one of the reasons we lost all of our trust. Um, I just I shouldn't have done this, but I grabbed his phone and I looked at his text messages, and I found there were tons of girls that I'd never heard of, and I knew that he knew a lot of people from the business, so I didn't worry too much about it. But what bothered me was there were um, not only were some flirtations like I had suspected, which bothered me, but it wasn't necessarily a crime. Um, but there were plenty of uh, uh, there were like plans, like things like. Um, 
well, where do you want to meet? Oh, well, I don't know where's the best place for us. Where's the best place? Wherever the best place for us to make out is, you know. And I was like, what? Oh my gosh, you know, we've been dating for, for a few months at this point, and and he always said, well, we're not dating anybody else, and and to him that was, I think, reasonable enough because I think in his mind he was making out with other girls, but he wasn't dating them. Was okay. And the only reason I think that's true is because of what we continued to do while he was dating Lisa, and I didn't realize that either. Um, so I confronted him about it. Actually, I didn't confront him at first. I should have been an adult about it and confronted him, but I held it in for a few weeks, and then it all came out, and that's when we broke up. And so I just realized that I, I, don't, I didn't feel like I could trust him fully to be monogamous, and I don't think that he could trust me fully to not get back in his phone someday and then try to find something out. So. Do you hear this? She's about to break the sound barrier with how fast she's talking all while attempting to answer Detective Flores' question about why she and Travis broke up. She can't seem to provide a simple answer to a simple question, which in and of itself is suspicious. And all that comes across is the overzealous rambling of a self-absorbed narcissist hell-bent on misdirecting law enforcement. April or so? I think he left. Uh, yeah, I hung around. I was in the University 6 ward, went there. He was in his Desert Ridge ward, and we we didn't live that far apart. So, I mean, I was over there a lot. Um, not not a lot, lot, because he had his own social circle from his church that I didn't really want to interact with, <laughs> because I, I sensed that maybe there was a little bit of awkwardness there because of Lisa. And because of Elena and I Oh, that's right. Lisa went out to that. You sensed a little bit of awkwardness, Jody. Maybe that's because you slashed Lisa's tires, who, by the way, was Travis's girlfriend at the time. And that was right after you slashed Travis's tires twice because of the same reason. I don't know. Maybe that had something to do with the awkwardness you felt around his closest friends. But what do I know? I just live in reality where there are actual consequences for things like stalking and hacking and destroying people's property. And you mentioned it. I mean, obviously you guys dated before. And yeah, we did. We dated were, last year. We're kind of just still really good friends, but not you know, romantically seeing each other anymore. Uh, not exactly. Um, uh, we well, broke up last... Kind of. Yeah, and I would say there was there was certainly a romantic side to it, you could say, or an intimate side to it. Um, but uh, we weren't exactly on the path to marriage, anything like that, and we both knew that. This is now the fourth time in two conversations that Jody has mentioned that they were not on the path to marriage. And again, at no point has Detective Flores asked her whether or not they ever planned or discussed marriage. When trying to establish a motive for a crime, oftentimes the offender responsible for that crime will give you subtle little hints at the issues that caused the crime to occur from their perspective. Jody continues to demonstrate the primary issues she had with Travis that drove her to commit this vicious attack. because I was at his house a lot. Um, but I didn't go to his house unless I was invited over, unless he knew I was coming over. Um, he would send me text messages late at night saying, hey, I'm getting sleepy, dot, 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 with some Z's, um, dot, dot, dot. And that was like, that became like my cue. That became like our code word for, um, I'm falling asleep, you can come over now and sneak into my room and wake me up kind of thing. And so um, that would happen a lot. And uh, I, I... I mean, I don't want to make this unpleasant or anything, but I mean... Um, was there still a sexual relationship going on after that? Yeah, there was. Okay. Now, if you watched episode one of this series, you probably recall that Detective Flores had previously asked Jody this question. Repeating the same question is a common technique used by law enforcement to determine how the suspect will answer a repeat question. Unsurprisingly, Jody again fails to provide an explanation for why so many people are speaking so poorly of her. And when confronted with the fact that she was accused of being obsessive, 
Her only response is to simply imply that she would only show up so often because Travis was constantly inviting her over. One thing is abundantly clear. Just because Jody lies often doesn't mean she's always good at it. This house was in April when you left? Yeah, it was April I spent. Um, I had my friend Rachel that I originally moved down with gave me a futon to sleep on. Uh -huh. And I gave that back um, about a week, week and a half prior to moving. Her, her and her husband came out with his truck and they loaded it up because they, they did, were just lending it to me, and I didn't want to move it. So they came and got it, and I didn't have a bed. And, and he was like, you know, you just come stay with me. So I pretty much stayed there <clears throat> for the last week. Last? Yeah, his roommate said something about, you You know, the last day you had a U-Haul and you were leaving, and uh, you had stopped by to say goodbye or something. Yeah, I had the U-Haul, and I, I was already there, but I parked it around the corner because it's was huge and I had a car, my car on the back of it, so I couldn't just park it right out in front of his house. So there's a, there's a little, uh, you go just past his house around the corner. Mm -hmm. I had the U-Haul parked there. Okay. It's like, so, so be, yeah. Do you remember what day April it was? I don't. I will not say, I keep thinking the 9th, but before you quote me on that, I can, I can check. But towards the beginning of April. Sometimes. Yeah, it was like more towards the middle, but it was already, with, Maybe toward the beginning, yeah. Because originally I was supposed to leave early April, like April 1st, like a little after April Fool's, but I ended up staying um, another four or five days. Did it you was stay like, there with him or something? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, with him. Listen closely to this next segment coming up concerning Travis's camera. Detective Flores is about to demonstrate his considerable skill at trapping Jody in her own web of lies. Lies that will only serve to impeach her credibility at the trial we are now watching. Yeah, yeah I have a lot of pictures. Actually, he just bought a, he had just purchased the camera. Uh, yeah, I remember that. A, I mean, we found the box in his house and everything. Yeah, he, um. Did, did you help him buy that or? I did, yeah. I was, I was living here, but he called me for uh, advice and, yeah, I, and I was on the phone with him. That's who I called. I, I saw know. somebody who knew what they were doing before I bought a camera. Yeah, and I guess since I'm a photographer, he, he, he texted me and he was like, what do you think of this camera? And I texted him back, well, what about this? And finally I was like, just call me, this is too complicated. So he called me and he was going over, I was like, ask her this. And so he was asking the sales rep, well, what about this, this, and this? And, Where's the flash located? Megapixels and the brand. I was like, don't get into Kodak, you know, <clears throat> just different things. So eventually he settled on. I don't remember what he got, but it was. It sounded like it was a really nice camera. Do you remember when so, he got that camera? Uh, April, maybe. I know it was after I moved. It could have been in May. Okay. Could have been in May. Um, I know it was after I moved up here because I was I was here while I was on the phone with him purchasing it. So you, so never, you never got to see the camera then or anything. No, and I'm trying to remember. Well, we, Maybe. the reason I'm asking is because we found this camera and, and, you know, it's pretty much ruined and we didn't know why. Oh. I can't, you know, discuss why, but, you know, or how it's ruined, but, you know, we just, it, we just don't found it. We have no idea why somebody would, you know, destroy his camera. And, uh, oh. I wonder if you could describe it to me, but obviously you haven't seen it. You've never touched it, never seen it. So. No, um. Oh, I think, I'm thinking there's a picture of him on Facebook where he took a picture of himself in the mirror. Okay. And I think that's his camera. So, I mean, I can't tell what it is, though, because the picture isn't really sharp and it's a small resolution. But there's a picture of him on his profile picture on Facebook. Oh, yeah, he's kind of Jody's responses are the epitome of inauthentic when she is presented with the facts concerning the camera she tried to destroy. Her incoherent rambling about his picture from MySpace is a clear attempt at dissembling and trying to avoid being pressed any further about this issue. In this moment, she's likely panicked and hoping above all else that they haven't found the pictures she took that night. But little does she know that law enforcement already has those pictures from the homicide that she committed, and they're about to prove it. Calling Jody Arias. It's uh, 6:25:08 at 1105 hours. DR 
It's important to point out the fact that just a few days before Monday, June 2nd, 2008, Jody and Travis had a vicious argument over Google Chat, and Jody would begin enacting her plan to end his life immediately after it. And while we do not know the substance of what they discussed telephonically, we can surmise that Jody was attempting to reestablish some form of trust with him so that by the time she would arrive in Mesa just two days later, Travis would open the door. Sadly, he couldn't have possibly known the dark plans Jody had been concocting. So, um, yeah, that, that was primarily what that one consisted of. And, you know, he knew I was taking a road trip that week. And he was kind of guilting me because I wasn't going to Arizona. I was going to Utah. Um, yeah. Why, was yeah, there, nice was there a conference or something in Arizona as well? Or? It was um, the, the primary reason, I, and I didn't tell Travis this, but the primary reason I was going there was to meet somebody. Um, and you know, we, we weren't like totally open about our dating lives just because it was just an area where we just kind of decided it would be best to not give each other all those details. And so, you know, just cause we had a past from before and you know, he, we kept each other like moderately informed. Like he told me a little bit about this person, a little bit about this person, but we didn't go into a lot of details. So I didn't tell him that I was making this big trip out to Utah to go see somebody. I think he suspected it, though. He was just like, well, who are you, you, know, who are you going out there to see? And I'm like, oh, nobody. I'm just going out, you know, to see friends. Because we both have um, a mutual circle of friends in Utah, yeah. you know, from prepaid legal. So I told him that that was the reason I was going was there is a, there's a briefing out there. It's called a business briefing, which happens every week on Thursday night. So um, I was leaving for that, and, you know. Was actually there was that reason because I knew I would see a lot of my friends that night, but also to spend time with with my other friend that I was meeting, um, and his name is Ryan. In my research of this case, one thing kept coming up with Jody's history, and that was her constant attempts at trying to make Travis jealous. She went so far as to fabricate a story about a stalker that was simply desperate to be with her, and then sent Travis the alleged emails so that he would urge Jody to move to Arizona. But in this moment, Jody is attempting to convince Detective Flores that she had moved on, that she was already seeing someone else in Utah. Sadly, Jody's ridiculous stories only serve to dig her deeper and deeper into a grave of her own making. Um, so I talked to him that day, and later on that morning, I got on the road. Um, and my car isn't the best mechanically, so I stopped in Reading at the airport to rent a car, and someone had driven me there. My, my future soon-to-be sister-in-law drove me there. Um, 
and let's see, I got the car, came back to my brother's house and took a nap for a while because I'd been up all night. And then I got on the road and I went to Santa Cruz and I met up with some other friends who from the Monterey area. Okay. So I have lots of friends there and I stayed the night at a friend's house there and visited it with some other friends um, the next day and then drove to L.A. so that I could see my... Uh, other friend's baby. I'm a photographer. I don't know if I told you that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I'm a photographer. She just recently had a baby, and I'm trying to build my portfolio with, um, you know, infants and things like that. And she what was really excited. Name again? Her name is Laura Brewer. She actually never called me back. She did call me back, but she called me back too late. So I couldn't just wait around for her. I had an itinerary. And she was so just was, a friend, or? She, um... She's a really close friend. I dated her brother for about four years, so we were, we're a lot like family still. Oh, okay. Hang on just a quick second. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So that's the last time Andrew talked to him. It was like on Monday morning. Um... Yeah, I'm sorry. I did talk to him on Tuesday night. Oh, Tuesday night. It was brief, though. So, um... Like, that was a matter of just a few minutes. It wasn't, like, a really in-depth conversation. Um, what time it was? Oh, 10 o'clock, maybe? 10 p.m.? Yeah, I'd say 10 p.m. or maybe 9 p.m., 9.30, 10, 10, 30, something around there. I could, I guess I could go back and check. About 9 to 10, anywhere. Uh, Somewhere between then. Okay. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a late, it was, a, like, kind of a late evening. Yeah, I mean, for us, that's not late, but. What was the purpose yeah. of that call? Um, just calling just check in and say hey and let them know just hi. Okay. <laughs> I was just calling people because I was bored and I was on the road. Oh. Did you catch that? It's very subtle and you, you almost have to go back and listen to it again. She says that she was calling to check in to say hey and then she says let him know just hi. Go back, rewind it and listen to it again. Because it sounds like she almost accidentally said I was just calling him to say hey letting him know that I was on my way. Because what she said doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But being the consummate master of dissembling, she quickly finds an excuse and says that she was just bored calling people randomly. The sheer number of times we've caught Jody lying in a matter of two relatively short phone calls surpasses human understanding. Oh, so you were on the road at that time? Yeah. It was real brief. Um, he was... He was nice and cordial, but he was kind of acting like he had hurt feelings because he knew I wasn't going to. Oh, I think probably... The reason I'm asking is we're trying to figure out you know, when this actually occurred. Uh, as people are saying, they, they kind of lost contact with him maybe on Tuesday. Um, on Tuesday? Tuesday or Wednesday, so people aren't sure. They're I, to think back. And, I talked to him last Tuesday, and I, I'm sure I called him. I may have called him Wednesday. I know I called him again from the road twice. I sent him a couple of text messages. I sent him a picture. Did you actually uh, talk to him, though, when you were on the road? Um, yeah, but it was it was when I... When you first started. It was, yeah, yeah, it was, it was... Yeah, I did talk to him when I was on the road, but it was, I'm sure that was Tuesday night. Okay. And, uh... So I figured he was either in California because he was planning to go there um, that week, I think. Because he, he had to, I, he, I know he was going to California sometime before Cancun because he was going to leave his dog with his grandmother. Um, do you remember, I didn't know his time. Do you remember what time what? on Tuesday night it was that you talked to him? Oh, it was it was dark. So it was I think it was like maybe 10, maybe 10 o'clock, so 9 and at that time, you were still kind of like, were you still heading to L.A. area, um, or were you already up going to Utah? Yeah, I was in Pasadena when I talked to him okay. that time. I think I was, I think I just left Starbucks or something, I don't remember. I don't know if I had gotten gas yet or what, but I left Starbucks and I was talking to him. During the discovery phase of her case, the prosecution would uncover the fact that Jody had purchased gas cans the day before Travis's homicide. She would have three in total. So her comment about getting gas was another provable lie because she never stopped for fuel at any point of her fateful trip to end Travis's life. 
these calls are absolutely littered with provable moments where Jody clearly intended to manipulate and misdirect law enforcement every step of the way. How, what was the conversation about? It was really brief. It was um, two or three minutes. And I just said, hey, you know, I'm on the road still and going, you know, you know, I was headed to Utah. And I just called because I called my sister and I think I called, I, I may have called Ryan. I don't know if I called him yet or not at that point. But um, I was waiting around for a while uh, for, for Laura and she, I didn't know where she lived and couldn't get over brother because he was at work. And I didn't want to just show up at her house because I hadn't heard back from her. So, um, I was just killing time and called him, talked to him briefly, and and uh, that's about the last time people were were able to get a hold of him as well. And then uh, what's unusual is you know people are saying, yeah, you know, we text him and call them, and then pretty soon his uh, his voicemail was full. Yeah, that's unusual because he deletes messages. Like he doesn't save anything, even if it's halfway sentimental. Like he rarely yeah. saves that stuff. So the next time you, you tried to call him, you weren't able to, to get a hold of him? Uh, no, I left him a message, um, and I sent him text messages. And he, he doesn't always pick up, but he's usually pretty good. And he doesn't always respond to text messages either. But when I didn't hear from him for like two days, and I called him again, and I didn't want to be obsessive about it um, because, you know, we're not together anymore. And I'm just like, I don't like calling him too much, but... We, he called me or I called him, and it, it was a pretty good balance. But um, at one point, it, it was like, okay, at what point do I start calling friends that live there? Yeah. You know, that thought crossed my mind, but I was like, no, he's in California. You know, he's going to Cancun. Every word of what Jody just said is a lie. But let's step back for just a moment. Imagine that you don't know anything about Jody Arias, you don't know the facts of the case. And the last minute of this call is the only thing you have heard from her concerning the homicide of her ex-boyfriend. If you just listen to it, it sounds incredibly believable and convincing. But even her best performance wouldn't be enough to dissuade the attention of law enforcement from pursuing justice for Travis and his family. I didn't. So I hung out there for a while uh, at Starbucks and, you know, just refueled and all that. And we talked on the phone for a little bit and then just got on the road and went to Utah. Um, slept in my car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a long drive from L.A. It's about, it's about nine hours. So, yeah, it's actually just as long to go from L.A. to West Jordan as it is to go from Wairika to L.A. Um, let's see. So the meeting in Utah, when did that happen? Mm-hmm. That was Thursday night at 7 o'clock. I don't remember the exact location, but I followed Ryan there. Oh, so you met him then? Yeah. Yeah, I ended up, um, we crushed at his house for a little while and, you know, just hung out and all that. And then, uh, okay. went to the and then slept a little bit longer because I was, you know, okay. until I got on the road. And then... Somebody had talked to, I can't remember who it was up there in Utah. Um, they called me and just, they said they knew, they knew Travis. They said that there was a, a meeting on Wednesday, or was it Thursday? Uh, there is a luncheon on Wednesday. <clears throat> I didn't go to that, though. I don't think okay. I went to that. No, I, I went to some kind of meeting. It was at a restaurant. The restaurant owner's name is Chris, and he's in the, he was recruited by Brian. Well, maybe that's what they said. It, it, it's kind of like a split-up meeting. One day they had like a lunch, and then the other day the meeting. That's, that's yeah. What they meant. Yeah, I don't think I went to the lunch. Um, okay. It's like a thing that happens. At tw- it's the same kind of deal, only it's set in a restaurant instead of a like a business-style meeting. Okay. Whereas in the meeting, you just kind of sit for an hour and you listen to a presentation for 45 minutes or however long it takes, mm-hmm. and. Uh, to lunch and you listen to the same thing, but you get to eat lunch. Detective Flores is trying to establish a timeline for Jody's whereabouts in the days after Travis's homicide. Jody knows this, and yet she seems to think that describing these meetings and what goes on in them is somehow useful for a homicide detective trying to solve a murder. The patience that Detective Flores demonstrates in these calls should qualify him for an award. But pay close attention to this next segment, 
because Detective Flores is about to get Jody to say something truly incredible that will become just one more bloodstained nail in her coffin. So did you ever stop by Vegas on the way up? I went through Vegas. <laughs> no. <laughs> I go there once a year anyway for the pre-state legal thing, and I've never been a gambler <laughs> or that kind of lifestyle. So, uh, no, I, I just drove through. I drove through. Um, I, I went through Boulder City, and I went through Vegas. I don't remember all. I think Henderson, um, you know, until I went up through, I think it was St. George. It took a while. I was on the phone with the night with Ryan that time, but... Um, you know, so he could keep me away, but I still had to pull over anyway. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not shy about just pulling over wherever and sleeping in my car. Oh, and then on the road. Be careful. It is, it is. It's, it's not the smartest thing. I realize that. Um, I usually park my car in a place where I can just drive off if I need to, so I have it backed out instead of, um, you know, and I have the keys in the ignition. I've got, I'm ready to go, but... Either way, it's still kind of unsafe. Anyone could break a window or something. But. Uh, you know, if it's day and age, you can some protection or something if <laughs> you're driving along. I was thinking of that. I know, and I, I just, <laughs> I don't know. I guess I do. But, it's not too difficult. Um, say, well, California, I would say it's a little more difficult because at least in Arizona, you don't even have to register any weapons. You just kind of, you just go by really? and that's it. You know, well, well I've actually it. looked into, I've actually looked into handguns um, because I have like, I have a list of, like things that I'm really scared of that I'm trying to overcome, mm -hmm. and that's one of them. And, and being in front of a public crowd is another. And I was shaking when I sang the, the national anthem. <laughs> there was only like 200 people, but I had to hold the mic with both hands. It was shaking. So actually, I got that from Travis. Just trying to push yourself and get out of your comfort zone and, and make yourself uncomfortable and do things that you're scared of. And, and uh, so I, you know, I've been looking into that. But handguns are expensive, and you know, it's not really in my price range right now. It's not. Jody's comments about trying to overcome her fear of handguns is one of the most ridiculous things I've heard from her in this call. I genuinely wonder if she has any idea how idiotic this sounds as she's saying it. Jody, you are speaking to a homicide detective. Someone who has already told you that the friends and family of the victim think you are involved. Do you really believe that this veteran detective is going to buy that you are afraid of handguns, so therefore you must not have been involved in this crime? I have to admit, the prosecution's expert witness, Janine DeMarte, was spot on when she said that Jody demonstrated signs of incredible immaturity, because Jody has a truly astounding lack of self-awareness. Um. Anyway, what was I saying with that? Um, oh, no, we just discussed, uh, the, you know, the next two days after that, you weren't able to get a hold of him. And yeah. You were thinking about calling his friends. And to yeah, and that's part of the reason I didn't is because I, I knew that I, it just, it didn't feel like my place any longer to be like his mother and, and calling his friends. You know, so, so you knew him. about his, his trip. And uh, do you remember him telling you when he, when he was leaving for his trip? Yeah, yeah, because we had discussed uh, days of travel up here, so... Um, I asked that he had said that he was leaving the tent. I didn't know how long it would be. I don't know if it was four or five days or six days. But um, I did know that the last we had discussed is his trip up here was going to be after Cancun and before D.C., so it would be sometime toward the end of June. And it would probably be a four-day thing for me, or a three-day thing, but longer for him because he was traveling along the California coast and then on to Washington. Okay, so he was going to leave the tent, and when was he going to come back? Um, I don't know I exactly, but I know that they're there. Telling Detective Flores that she didn't know how long Travis would be gone in Cancun is, of course, complete BS. We know this because Jody was originally supposed to go with him on this trip, and she doesn't want law enforcement to know that Travis had changed his mind because that would give another reasonable motive for ending his life. The irony is that her incessant need to lie and mislead as some perverse means of self-preservation helped law enforcement to narrow their focus onto her faster than if she had just not said anything at all. Uh, yeah, have you heard anything? But, well, when did you first find out what happened to him? Uh, Dan called me 
Dan who? Dan Freeman, I'm sorry. Oh, Dan Freeman. He called me um, Monday, I think it was Monday night, but it, it was more like, I think it was late Monday night, like 11 something. And uh, he said, hey, how are you doing? I was like, Dan, because I would have thinking, been thinking about him and I was planning my trip to Arizona and he was definitely on my list of people to visit. I love him and his family. Um, I used to go there every Sunday for dinner. Um, and and I said, hey, how are you doing? He's like, great. And I said, hey, I'm thinking about making a trip out there. And he's like, yeah, I think you're going to have to. Okay. And I was like, yeah, yeah. You know, there was a pause. He's like, and then he's like, yeah, um, there's, there's, it's just about Travis. And I was like, um, what? You know, like, that's never good. Yeah, but, the way he said that, yeah. Yeah. So, but I didn't think anything at first. I mean, it just kind of okay, what? You know, we don't want to assume too soon. And, and he said, uh, he said they found him. And I was like, what does that mean? Well, I don't know. Well, what do you mean you don't know? What, what, what do you know? Well, I don't really know anything right now. I just know that, that Brent Hyatt is at his house and, and Taylor Searle is at his house and that the cops are there. And I was totally shocked. I don't think that I said much. Um, I think that I just... I just kept thinking that maybe there's a mistake. Maybe there's a mistake. Are you sure? And he didn't really know, so I kept saying that maybe there was just a mistake because he couldn't say anything. He didn't give me any information, so I thought he said I was the first person that he thought of to call, but I think he called um, a couple of other uh, leaders in, in Travis's business first that were close with him. I don't remember who he called or what order, but he called me, and uh, I keep thinking that maybe there was there, that they just made a mistake. And it, like I felt so helpless because I wasn't there. I still lived there. I was before I was like ten minutes away, not even ten, maybe seven minutes away. I could have just driven there, but and found out and, and saw what was going on. I just felt totally helpless. This is one of the many components of Jody's dysfunction at play. She's attempting to make herself out to be the altruistic hero who would have somehow found a way to save Travis if only she had been there. But she was there, and when you contrast her words against the backdrop of the brutality of her crime, it begins to put into focus why so many people believe her to be truly monstrous. What did you think about I mean, the last time you had talked to him was what? Was it Monday or Wednesday? What was it? I think it was um, Tuesday evening, I think. Yeah, Tuesday night. Yeah. Did you think of... You know, what was going on the last time you talked to him? Did you try to get a hold of him after that? Yeah, yeah, I did. I tried to get a hold of him. Um, I I called him Tuesday night. Um, I called him subsequently and emailed him um, a couple times. Uh, is there anything else that you can remember or think of or any theories or anything that could help us? I just... I just don't know. Travis was a friend to everybody. And yeah. there, even when things were bad between us, he was always, he would give his last, he would give his last dollar, his last whatever. He um, he was telling me he had a BMW, and I was actually supposed to email. Yeah, I um, that. He kind yeah. of burned it out or something. Well, he said he found, he said he found my check in his house. Check. Um, oh, yeah, I'd check that you gave him no, for payment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, um, I guess, like, I, this is so dumb, like, it seems so unimportant, but I guess I need to know if that check is going to be deposited anytime soon. No, no, once, I you know, after his death, it can't be deposited, so. Okay, let's recap. At this point in time, Jody Arias is almost 30 years old. She's speaking with a homicide detective concerning the brutal slaying of her ex-boyfriend. And she's asking a homicide detective if her personal check to Travis is going to be deposited anytime soon. If George R.R. R. Martin was tasked with writing a more self-centered, selfish, and idiotic line of dialogue, he absolutely couldn't do it. I simply cannot imagine a more inappropriate and obtuse question in a moment like this. Wow, Jody. Really? Yeah. Okay, well then I'll just consider that. Um, whatever, and then, I, and then I'll still own the full balance until they figure out what they're going to do. Honestly, I, I trashed his car, and he took it so well. Um, we were trying to figure out between my lawyers and his lawyers and prepaid legal and the insurance and the U-Haul who was going to be held liable. And, you know, it didn't matter who was held liable. The fact was I, that was a debt that I had promised to pay, and it was just money, and it wasn't worth 
you know, anything. So, um, I mean, as far as getting any, any contentions over, so um, he was never, he never had any doubt that I would pay him back, but he was trying, to, and this is what's difficult, is he was trying to um, work with the insurance um, to hold you all accountable um, for how it had all gone down. He said the engine just blew up. No, the, no, the vehicle was still in his name, correct? Yeah, he, still the, he was going to hold the title until I paid in and the balance in full. Did you guys have, like, so, a written contract or anything? Or? I had, yeah. What I did is I typed out an email to him, and I sent it. And um, I just wrote back, just reply, I agree if you agree with this. And he wrote back um, something about you didn't say anything on insurance. And so I was like, okay. So I amended that, I think, and then wrote back to him. And so that was our agreement. Our agreement was I pay him what I can each month until the balance is paid off. And I, I take care of general maintenance, like oil changes and tires and things like that. I don't know what's going on with, it, with this car or anything. I think it's just sitting there collecting dust. Yeah, um, his family's dealing with it because right now it's still considered one of his assets and it goes, oh. you know, so. Yeah, and I was told, and I should, probably should have done this, but I didn't know who to get a hold of or who was doing what, and I should have asked Dan first, but I emailed his sister to Nisha on MySpace, and I was like, yeah, I just sent her my condolences, and then I, in the next paragraph, was like, you know, it's really hard, but I, I owe Travis this amount of money, and I, I know that at one point I'll need to settle this debt, and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but if you need to be in contact with him about this, is my phone number. And, you know, she didn't get back to me, and um, I don't, you know, well, you know I, I don't. When a death occurs like this, it, you know, everything's got to go to probate anyways. Yeah, and I realize now that there's a, Mike Chapman is the executor of his will, and so I did get in touch with him yesterday, and he said, um, just give me all the information you have on that matter, and then we'll go from there and decide what's going to happen. The letter that Jody wrote to the family of Travis Alexander is one of the many reasons why her family petitioned the prosecution for the death penalty. It's 10 pages long and completely full of misdirections, lies, and attempts at trying to seem like she was the innocent ex-girlfriend who only ever loved Travis. And in a future episode, we will review the document in detail as it begins to show us the inner workings of Jody's mind prior to her eventually admitting to having killed Travis. Now in closing today, I wanna leave you with an important addendum. This channel is and will always be a voice and advocate for victims, their families, and anyone who fights for justice in these cases. My hope is that in shedding light into the dark recesses of these cases, we can illuminate the truth and hopefully prevent these violent criminals from ever leaving the confines of their imprisonment. But I want to thank you for joining me today. I am truly grateful for the opportunity to share my insights on this case with you. I'm already working on many new episodes for different cases, but please don't forget to comment with the case you'd like for me to cover in a future episode. Because this is just the beginning of where we're headed, and I'm just getting started. Stay tuned for episode three of the Jody Arias case and a new episode for a new case premiering in two weeks' time. This has been Behind Criminal Minds. We'll see you next time.